Everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your critique of the week for Friday, December 31st. Happy New Year's Eve to everybody out there. We had the last broadcast of 2021. So glad you could join me. Uh, D. Coleman, Nate Jacobs, Spartacus, and Dick Westheimer are here over on YouTube. Let me see over on Facebook. Yeah, Facebook is just, video on Facebook is just a dying beast, I think. Let's see, I'm going to refresh. Hey, Dana Broadhead's there. Good to see you, Dana. Yeah, it used to be when we started out doing the Critique Week, which I never mentioned, I think was three years ago in a month, so, or um, yeah, around December 1st, 20, uh, 2018 is when we started doing the Critique of the Week. At first, it was just on Facebook, and Facebook was trying to launch their video, you know, the video streaming thing to sort of competing with YouTube, and so they gave it a lot of reach, and those days are over, I think. We only have uh, a handful of people. We have six people watching on on Facebook. Um and that's been the case for a while. It's been fewer and fewer. People don't get notifications. I don't know. Facebook's given up on that. I think Facebook is just sort of slowly going into the metaverse anyway. Anyway, um, the point of the Critique of the Week, as always, is to uh, give that workshop experience to people who might not have access to, you know, seeing what strangers think and react honestly to their poems. It's also a chance to give uh, submitters to rattle a chance to see how the editor approaches poems and, and how, you know, what it feels like to read a submission, which is something people always ask for. But, of course, we get hundreds of poems submitted a day, and you can't do that. Um, you know, I'm just, just me and Megan are here reading poems, and, and uh, we can't really give feedback, but we can give feedback, you know, for a few poems a week. So we pick two poems, two poets every week, and... Uh, there's the music. And we, uh, we pick two poets every week, do two poems per each poet, and then everybody gets to see sort of how it feels to read a submission, too, in addition to um, helping out the poet. Um, let's see. Yeah, so Facebook's starting to pick up right now. So if we got up to 11 now, it's just much slower to, um, to, to bring people in, I guess. Anyway, let's see. Oh, Frank Beltrano's here and Lisa Allison over there. Kurt Linderman. Good to see you all. Tom Barlow. And, uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, we're up to 12 now, at least Facebook. It used to be we had a lot more on uh, Facebook. So, yeah, today's poet, uh, the first poet of the two poets we're looking at is Attracta Fahey. And we're going to look at two poems um, that have mythological references, which is not a, not my specialty. But, um, but we'll see how these go. Uh, this first one is... I didn't love in the name of God, after Anne Sexton. And there's some explanations here, which um, for me are good. I, I have really, I don't know if it's just me. I, I've mentioned this before, but I have trouble keeping track of all the myths. So anytime we get a poem submitted with one of these Greek myths, I can't remember who anybody is, no matter how. It's just I can't keep it in my head. <laughs> like Persephone and, and Demeter and, you know, all those different Greek gods and goddesses and things. Um and here we're looking at a Celtic god, a Celtic goddess, I think. But um, but I can't keep all that stuff straight. So what I do is I just Google everything. You know, if there, if the poem looks um, interesting at all, then I Google uh, and remind myself what the god or goddess is or whatever we're talking about. But here is um, I didn't I didn't love it's better better spot. I didn't love in the name of God after Anne Sexton. And again, this is um, attractify. Um, Deirdre, got your text. You said you'd left the city. Although not a prophet, I already knew this was how it would be. I think it's a little... Let me fix the brightness a little bit. I think it's a little, a little hard to see. A little better. See, hopefully that's a little better. Um, okay, Deirdre, got your text. You said you'd left the city. 
Although not a prophet, I already knew this was how it would be. We are so predictable. Friends are like white horses, a comfort, yet only hold up when there's commonality of need. I hung in like a molting bird after your goodbye Judas kiss, and you'd slipped across into my palm. Precious talisman, twenty cents, made in Taiwan. I didn't love the name of God or Mary. I love from my name and child in you, the longing, distress, empty days between your trips to Medigorgy and hopes of seeing Our Lady. Poor banished children, both of us turning gods into symptoms, worries, stress. Although we've, we've different saviors, I also light candles in threes, recently asked St. Thomas to intercede. I'm not jealous, all those prayers, and you still need me to do things that Our Lady will never do. I've been there, falling asleep reading novenas, wrinkled pictures on the floor, begging our, for strength in this world which demands more strength, long nights looking at the stars, seeking windows to higher worlds. I believe the promise of mercy, walking fields, talking to him, kneeling before chip statues, those cold mothers smiling at my pain. I know the sequence of saints lined up like planets. They don't move. Anthony, Rita, Jude. I know how many steps one must climb to get inside the church to trust you're not abandoned. How good one must be. How much sacrifice to be loved. I hear you, the saints intimate. We're here and you're down there on your knees and have to carry your cross. After all the prayers, it was under the green trees, branches caressing my face, that I found heaven. Let's forget, Deirdre. You of great sorrow, my work is done. Who needs friendship? We have suffering, and we love the cross. My God, how many have you slipped into my bag? I'm working as delivery woman, distributing to the lonely, homeless, hungry. Here, take one, I say. This is your body and blood, your cavalry. This is your love, your home, your food. Rejoice in your cross. And um, and then there's a note here, which um, I, th I think it's part of the poem. Um, Deirdre is the name of a tragic heroine in Irish myth um, known as Deirdre of the Sorrows in Gaelic. Deirdre on Broin. Sorry if I'm, I'm butchering that. Um, I chose the name Deirdre as Anne Sexton addresses her poem to Ruth, a biblical name in the poem, with mercy for the greedy, which inspired my poem. So, so we have the myth of Deirdre. Um, Deirdre, let's see, Deirdre um, of the Sorrows. Let's 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 look that up because that's what I would do if I read the submission. Um, So I would I would just Google it because I'm I'm a curious person even though I can't keep these things in my head I still like reading about them. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, her story is part of the Ulster cycle, best known of stories of pre-Christian Ireland. Deirdre was the daughter of the royal storyteller um, Fedlamid, before she was born. Cathbed, the chief. Druid at the court. I'm reading from Wikipedia, and the at the court of Conchobar Mac Nessa, king of Ulster, prophesized. Well, this is a long story. Um, you'll have to read more of that later, but um, but so this is the poem for this week. I didn't love in the name of God. Deirdre got your text. So so the first thing I'm I'm thinking of, and I I just feel like a broken record on these, but but it's hard to enter a poem where you don't know wh what you're entering or who's speaking. So, so once Deidre got your text, like we really, we're sort of lost in like time and space here. Um, and there's a really interesting sort of, um, so, so at the beginning of the poem, we're trying to piece together and figure out like where we actually are. So Deidre got your text. It's a great opening. I actually really like this. Um, it, it sets up this sort of, um, anachronism or, or something where we're we're talking about the future in the past at the same time you know with it with a text is something you'd get um so it feels like the i mean my interpretation of it as we move through the poem is that um you know, we're talking about deirdre um 
as a sort of like having an actual conversation. Like, like I got your message in from the universe kind of thing. That's how I'm interpreting it. But the problem is it's really tough to figure out um, where to place yourself. So you're spending a lot of energy instead of connecting with the speaker, trying to figure out where you are within the space of this poem. Um, so Deirdre got your text. You said you'd left the city, although not a prophet. I already knew this was how it would be. Um, so there's, it feels like that we're jumping in. Uh, what's it called when you're jumping into the middle of the action of a plot? I'm sorry if my that's my dog outside. If you hear, that's Henry. Um, um, so we're sort of jumping in the middle of the action, and and you're sort of trying to f- get a sense of balance for the whole beginning of the poem. I would say. So I, I wonder if it would be better to like introduce the speaker a little bit so we know who's talking and like what the situation is. That's something that that we just asked for a lot here because it's a little bit difficult to. Um, to follow. Let's see. And so I think, and so Nate Jacob here is saying something, something similar, a strong finish to this poem. I think after the tree, it really became strong, but it took me a long time to find my way to that point. And so that's just the main thing. Um, it's really hard to approach, like if you turn the page in a literary magazine or something, I mean, in a book, it might be a different story, which is why we always talk about this, um, this sort of dichotomy between poems living independently um, and living in a series in a book where you sort of know the characters already or who the voice is. You have sort of expectations in a context when you read the poem in a book um, or in if it's a long series of poems. But if you're, if you're just encountering one poem, which is how it's usually done in magazines, you, you really get, a, you get lost really easily. And that's one thing just you always have to highlight is that um, it, it's, easy, it's easy for readers to get lost in, in what you're saying. And so, Deidre, I got your text. You said you'd left the city. Although not a prophet, I already knew this was how it would be. We're so predictable. Friends are like white horses of a comfort. I like white horse. I think there should be a comma there. Um, a comfort, yet only hold up when there's commonality of need. And again, we, and then we don't have um, punctuation here. I hung like a molting bird after your goodbye Judas kiss. And you'd slip the cross into my palm. Precious talisman, 20 cents made in Taiwan. So we have this whole scene playing out, and I still am not sure like where we are in, in space and time. And and it makes it it just makes it a little hard to, to I don't feel grounded. I feel like I'm just sort of drifting around in some ephemeral space instead of being connected to it, is the problem at the beginning. I didn't love in the name of God or Mary. I love for my name and the child in you, the longing, distress, empty days between your trips to Mugdugjori. Mug, yeah, I don't know how to say that. Medugjori. <laughs> I can't even try. In hopes of seeing Our Lady. Poor, banished children, both of us, turning gods into symptoms. So this is the first, it starts to pick up here. Like Nate Jacob mentioned, it picks up later. Um, Attracta has a note here. De- Deirdre pined for her beloved Nois. Um, after she was being forced to marry the king of Ulster, speaking pining for speaker pining for a friendship, so, that, so that's the the situation in the poem, and that was attracted the poet here to explain um, the part of the story that matters most, um, and um, yeah, so so that I don't know, like you really want to like front load the the context. Um, let's see, Lisa Ellison says, well, I love the imagery of the white horse. It took me out of the poem a bit as it didn't stay within the overall theme, unless I'm missing a reference to the symbolism of white horses. Yeah, and, and so we're sort of sort of all swimming in the space where there's interesting stuff here, but it's almost like you don't know, it's almost like you're in like a, like a tsunami or something. You don't know what to grab onto. There's like pieces of things everywhere, and you don't know really where you are, or you're not really oriented. And so there's interesting details throughout the beginning section of this poem. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I didn't love in the name of God doesn't, is a title, doesn't give you a lot to go with. And then the first line sort of jumps right into the action. Um, and so we're sort of trying to find our place. And we spend a lot of energy trying to find our place. Um, but poor banished children, both of us turning gods into symptoms, worries, stress. Although we've uh, different survivors or saviors. I also light candles in threes, recently asked St. Thomas to intercede. I'm not jealous, all those prayers, and you still need me to do things that Our Lady will never do. Another, I, like this, I like these simple lines here. 
Um, I've been falling asleep reading novenas. Is that? I've never heard novena. Is that? What's a novena? Um, novena in Christianity, a term de um, designating a spiritual devotion consisting of the recitation of a set form of prayer for nine consecutive days in petition for a divine favor or in preparation for a liturgical feast or as participation in an important event such as a year of jubilee. That's cool. So I just, one of the things I just love about reading poems and submissions is I, I learned so much just because I, I'm like, hey, what's that? And then you look it up. Um, so I've been there, falling asleep, reading novenas, wrinkled pictures on the floor, begging for strength in this world which demands more than strength. I thought that was a great line. Um, uh, where is it? The, the begging for strength in a world, this world which demands more than strength. Really good way to put it. That's good stuff. Um, long nights looking at the stars, seeking windows to higher worlds. I believe the promise of mercy. So, so if we, so, so um, Nate Jacob mentioned already that, and we've been talking about how the poem sort of jumps into the middle of an action, which makes it tough to feel where you are. If we jumped in in a place more like this, where if it was more like I've been there, falling asleep reading novenas, wrinkled pictures on the floor, we're sort of, instead of like an action that's going on, um, where we're trying to build a scene, it, it this section focuses much more on the speaker's voice, which is sort of one thing, which can be the one thing to hold on to, so we don't f get that lost feeling. So maybe starting with this kind of monologue, and, and sort of moving this up, and then coming to the... um to the, the part with the friend and, and where we have to negotiate different characters in, Deir, in Deirdre. Um, maybe that would be a better start, and then we could introduce this stuff later, where we already feel comfortable with the voice, and then we'd feel like, uh, like we know where we are in the poem. That might be a way to, to get around this issue. Um, I believe the promise of mercy, walking fields, talking to him, kneeling before chip statues, those cold mothers smiling at my pain. I know the sequence of saints lined up like planets. They don't move. Anthony, Rita, and Jude. So see, so the voice here is so strong with the repetition and, and the, the, the power of the speech that's coming out of the speaker's voice here. I mean, this really strong um, writing, which, which makes it, pulls us through the poem, I think. And, and so, so this is where it takes off in the second half, as, um, as Nate was saying. Um, Oops, I meant to check this part, but anyway. I know how many steps one must climb to get inside the church, to trust you're not abandoned, how good was, one must be, how much sacrifice to be loved. Um, I, I love this line, too. This is really great. I, meant, I, meant, I like that. Um, I know how many steps one must climb to get inside a church. I think that's a great um, you know, use of symbolism, a great metaphor there. Um, to trust your other band. I'm not sure this is necessary. I think the metaphor even works better if you don't it don't expand it and just let it sit there by itself. How good one must be, how much sacrifice to be loved. I hear you, the saints intimate. We're here and you're down there on your knees and have to carry your cross. Um, so one tiny note, um, I don't, unless there's a reason, I would always use double quotes. Um, you know, another thing we always talk about is if anything is different about the punctuation, it ends up making you wonder why. And, um, you know, single quotes sort of, well, they mess up the typesetting a little bit and it's not normal. So you're just like, why? I wonder why they're using that. Even if, even if it's just a brief thought, I wonder why they're using single quotes. Um, it's a thought that you have as you're reading. And because um, usually single quotes will be used for quotes within quotes. Um and that's that's pretty much the only use um, for them normally. And so you wonder for a second, like, is this a quote within a quote? But it's not. And so there's that little bit of uh, unnecessary confusion. Um, and not, not confusion, but distraction. Anyway, after all the prayers, it was under the green trees, branches caressing my face that I found heaven. Let's forget it, Deirdre. You of great sorrow, my work is done. Who needs friendship? We have suffering, and we have we love the cross. Again, these are really good lines. Um, my God, how many of you slipped into my bag? I'm working as a delivery woman, distributing the lonely to the lonely, homeless, hungry. Here, take one. I say, this is your body and blood, your cavalry. This is your love, your home, your food. Rejoice in your cross. So the interesting thing about the second half of the poem, um, um, which I, I still am not. 
I don't know where we are really or who we're talking about. Um, Attract is here, and she said that the poem um, is about about friendship and um, and um, where was it? I can't remember how she put it. Um, opining for a friendship, yeah. So, um, so I still don't, I don't feel like really connected to the, the what's going on. But the strength of the voice is plenty to carry it through when it's consistent and and, it, and it, it's working that way, and we're drawn into the voice. And so, there's a way that you sort of have to negotiate where where the poem, um, you know, where you have to describe in detail and, and, and explain the situation where you don't. And at the end, it's working without that. And I, I just feel like this is the whole poem here. Um, Lisa Allison says, well, I love the imagery of the white horse. Oh, wait, no, that's not the one I was going to read. Um, oh, this is Nate Jacob. Again, frankly, the dear to references are unneeded for the poem's overall tone and message, and removing them would simplify and clarify from the get-go. Yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to say here. Um, Elizabeth Boquette mentioned, since we talk about the Anne Sexton uh, poem here, um, she sends us the link. Thank you for that. And so here, let, let's compare this, actually. This is a great example. I'm glad you, you know, sent this link. Uh, that was Elizabeth Boquette that sent this link. This is uh, With Mercy for the Greedy um, by Anne Sexton. I have to turn on my screen view. This from the Poetry Foundation. Thank you, Poetry Foundation, for having all the poems in the world. It's wonderful. Um, but now at the beginning here, um, with mercy for the greedy is the title. Um, and, but then we get this epigraph, which is exactly what we're talking about, right? Um, about not knowing where we are for my friend, Ruth, who urges me to make an appointment for the sacrament of confession. Um, and so we get this, this idea of, um, Ruth. So we get this sense of intimacy and like who we're talking about, even though we don't know who Ruth is, um, we still know that this is who the your is. Um, so we start concerning your letter in which you ask to me to call a priest, in which you ask me to wear the cross and that you enclose your own cross, your dog-bitten cross, no larger than a thumb. So here, like, like see the difference in this poem. This is really the, the key thing in so many, and I, I feel like we repeat ourselves over and over again, but the, the who, what, why, where, and when, the, the journalistic questions, um, if they're not answered, you're lost as a reader. And so you have to let us know like what's going on. Um, and it's, and if it's not something, if it's something where you want to get into the voice of the poem and, um, and run with it and go in strange directions, then, then just let us know as quickly as possible. And so, and, and Sexton here, um, I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, I'm imagining how she wrote the poem, but it, she might've written this poem and then realized, Hey, people don't know who I'm talking about with the your. And so I need this little epigraph to explain that it's my friend Ruth. And then we know that you're talking to your friend Ruth, and then we can go along for the ride. And um, so it's a great example of, of how to get this information up front, which, and if you look for this, um, it's, it's hard to find poems that, are, that succeed without, without letting you know where, where you're supposed to be. Um, um, so I pray to its shadow, um, that gray place where it lies on your letter. But so as, as all we know, you know, all we have to know is who that you is and who we're talking to and that it's a friend and it's Ruth and there's this intimate conversation going on here. Then we feel like instead of being lost and trying to figure out what we can grab onto to find out where we are, we're, um, we're feeling like we're listening in on this intimate conversation, which is something that we all love to do. I mean, it's just the, the way, you know, the human brains are made. We love learning that way. So, um, yeah, and, and so we get to move through all these images, but we know where we are the whole time. And here we get my friend, my friend, I was born. So that, that's what I feel like is missing uh, with this poem, which has inter really interesting metaphors and details. Um, but we just don't get a sense of where we are and who we're talking to well enough. And we can always just get that in the title. Um, it's something we always mention. Or, um, um, so, so I'm imagining, and maybe Deirdre is both, it, it might be, that this um the note is almost even throwing us off like what if it wasn't for the note like like seeing this irish myth described here um i was thinking i, I was wondering i spent a lot of time wondering if we're like talking to a god or not um or a saint or whatever deirdre is and uh but if i if i encounter the poem without that 
um, note. Would I, would I, would I assume this is just a friend? Hmm, I'm not sure. Maybe that throws you off. Dear Drew, I got your text. You said you'd left the city. Of the not a prophet, I already knew this was how it would be. We're so predictable. Friends are like white horses. Um, hmm. You just looked across my palm. Yeah. So, so if we if we just establish the relationship between the two at first, then we can go along for the ride. I think that's the main thing in this poem. There's some great lines, and it really picks up at the end. I love this this stanza in particular. The rhythm of that is so good. Um, um, let's forget it, Deirdre. You of great sorrow. My work is done. Who needs friendship? We have suffering, and we have the cross. My God, how many have you slipped into my bag? I'm working as delivery woman, distributing to the holy, the lonely, homeless, hungry. Here, take one, I say. This is your body and blood, your cavalry. This is your love, your home, your food. Rejoice in your cross. Um, yeah, it's just a very strong ending. Let me read more comments. Uh, Peter Denton says, Saints lined up like planets. Great. Yeah, that is. Um... Now, Lima Carcanis says, I would take out the 20 cents made in, um, made in Taiwan up here. Yeah, that does feel a little off. Like, the, the, the poem feels um, a lot more, um, I don't know, like high-minded or something. And um, getting down to that detail feels a little off for the rest of the voice, maybe. Um, D. Coleman says, um, after all the prayers, it was under the green trees, branches, caressing my face that I found heaven. A lovely poem in itself. Yeah, another great line. A lot of great stuff toward the end. Um, let's see. Peter Desmond says the Judas kiss is never explained. Yeah, there's a lot going on in this poem that's not explained. Where is the Judas kiss? Yeah, the Judas kiss. And so the... I hung in like a molting bird after your goodbye Judas kiss. You'd slip the cross into my palm. Um, yeah, so I'm assuming that the friendship, like we, the kiss was like a goodbye as if the friendship is lasting, but then it's not. You know, I think that that, that was my interpretation of it. Um, um, Clayton Clark says, yes, I wondered who the friend was exactly, though many great lines. Love those depths. Who needs friendship? I'm thrown by, um, and Kathy Shea right there says, who, um, I'm thrown by who needs friendship. Yeah, so so the, where was the who needs friendship? It's toward the end, right? Um, wherever that line is, like we don't, we just don't get a sense of who the characters are. And so it's tough to relate, even though there's great lines and great content in this poem. Um and Sean Hines says some of these lines are simply golden when the voice comes out. Completely agree. Yeah. Um, Bella Anna says, uh, I am liking this poem this much more second time of reading. The disappointment with religion really comes through with poignancy. Yeah. Yeah. I agree too. It, it, the more you read it, the more it's, you, you sort of um, get your sense of grounding. It takes many reads to sort of get your sense of where you are and, and where who's doing what. Um, and what the relationships are. But once you sort of get those a questions answered to your own satisfaction, I guess, then you can focus more on the, the um, text and what's going on. Um, and then more things start to resonate and make more sense and, and you feel more. And the problem is we want that, like most people aren't going to read your poem, you know, four or five times. Um, and so you have to get that that feeling of like the second read being better, Um or, or the you know the fourth read being better, you have to get that up front and make the first read that strong, or else people just aren't going to read it. Um, and Jenny Middleton said, "I think the Judas kiss is about friendship and its inconsistency." Yeah, that's what I I'd, I'd say too. Um, Jamie O'Halloran Whitmarsh says Judas brings betrayal, but is not developed. And Bernard Haskey says, "Isn't Judas kiss self-explanatory?" Well, I feel like like the the thing that's not is it makes you wonder. Um, you know, Judas kiss Judas is like a betrayal, like a like a I will kiss you as I stab you in the back kind of thing, and so so you wonder what the stab in the back was, like what the event that sort of brought these two friends apart um, actually is. 
And so, and, and it just leaves it hanging in the air and makes you wonder. Um, Marsha Owen says, love this poem overall, but I feel like it needs a good dusting. That's a good point. That's a good way to put it. I like that. I've never heard it put that way, but yeah. And then Lee McCarcana says, we just don't know if Deirdre is a betrayer or a sad, lost kind of goddess friend or a homeless person. The narrator is helping seeing friendship in strangers. Yeah, I mean, just the context. I mean, I, I just keep saying the same thing, but the context would let us access and engage so much more with other great content in the poem because there's great lines, a great voice, great rhythm to it. Um, one thing I, I, I only pointed out briefly, that the punctuation is inconsistent, which is something that should be, you know, we need we need punctuation um, if, if you're going to write in a certain style where there's not much punctuation or there's none at all, that's totally fine too. But it just has to be consistent or else it's a distraction. So other than the two big takeaways here are make the the poem clear, like where we are, the context, and then a sm much smaller and less important note, but do fix up the punctuation. There's missing commas and periods and things, and that throws you off a little bit. Um, okay, let's look at the other poem. It's already been about a half an hour, but... That was a, that's a rich poem with a lot of stuff. So is the next one, too. And we'll see if there's this one's a little more grounded and we, we lose ourselves more or not in the, in the context. It's a very similar um, way that there's references to a lot of different things that are, that are coming together in this poem. So there's a big note at the end, too. So be prepared for that. And I wonder, too, as I was looking at this just right before I went live, if we want to pull that up and, you know, put the epigram at the top or if it's right there at the bottom. That's an interesting question, too. But here's uh, the vagina goddess. I'm sorry, I have a sneeze, but it's not coming. But um, hang on. Um, okay, so um, the vagina goddess. Portland riots, Saturday night, Sunday morning, July 18th, 2020. Um, uh, 1.45 a.m. You know, before I, I see it, this new comment, let me just read this about the last poem. I'm attracted from Attracta. Deirdre represents a friend who became very religious and comes to me when she needs a friend, but never there when I needed a friend. Gives me crosses from Medjugorje, which I can still not say that. Sorry, but yeah. So, so that's just the context that's missing. And if we if we understood that context, then we would be able to engage in all the cool stuff in the poem. Um, so so sort of get that like it's just a perfect example. Um, we get that from the Anne Sexton poem. I'll, I'll put it over here. Um, we get the, um, from my friend Ruth, who are, we get the whole story. Like what you just left in the comment there, Attracta, is what Anne Sexton explained in her epigram, basically. Um, and then we're, we don't waste our time and, and energy wondering what the situation is. We just get to know that it's this friend who became religious. And so, um, so just put that up front, <clears throat> I think. Okay, let's go to the next poem, though. The Vagina Goddess, Portland Riot, Saturday night, Sunday morning, July 18, 2020. 1.45 a.m., nightly protests in Portland. Sheila Nagig walks out into the intersection, paces the crosswalk in front of armed police. Officers in riot gear, they stare, eyes fixed on her poise. Headlights glare as she moves in ballerina poses, naked other than face mask and cap. Hecatite lies down, kicks up her feet, refuses protection from others nearby, her body defying their thoughts. Yes, I'm vulnerable. That is my strength. She opens her legs, a flash to all who dare look, vagina goddess of Eleusinian mysteries. Eleusinian mysteries. Ba rises from the burial place of shame, takes the stone head off patriarchy. Come, come, her eyes say, to men who believe, you just grab her by the pussy. Come, her body invites, it's dream time again, divine feminine collective power. She tilts her head to her shoulder, they move away, grain goddess knows how to relieve tension. Baobo knows there's life, even in tragedy. And we have this um, epigram here. Um, or, uh, not epigram, but a note at the bottom. Um, so, Baobo or Ba, which we, uh, interestingly, we use both words here, Baobo and Ba. And I wonder why, if they're the same person. Um, Baobo or Ba, as she is known in the ancient Egyptian 
is the ancient Egyptian vagina goddess who, it is said, flashed her vulva to Demeter, making her laugh and releasing her from grief so that fertility was restored and starvation averted. She represents the feminine power restoring balance and calm. Um, and then a further note, um, I love reading the ancient myth and text, and when I read of this incident during the Portland riots, it resonated with me. I knew it had a deeper symbolic meaning. Interesting also, when I read the story about the woman in Portland, it said that when she walked out onto the street, the police and army stood quietly watching and did nothing until she left. It was as if they recognized some unconscious, on some unconscious level that this was significant, an ancient ritual repeated in modern times. Um, so, so we get again. We get the whole the sort of poem explained here, um, and I wonder. This is one of the questions I always have, um, or it just frequently comes up. Um, like, I'd, I'd sort of weirdly rather not be familiar with the with the content. Um, like, like I have to look up um, like Demeter or whatever. And I did happen to. I don't know how um, how familiar you are. It was that. Um, the woman came out naked during the Portland riots, it, you know, at 2 a.m. or whatever, like it said, and and sort of it was this really surreal scene. There's video of it um, all over the internet, um, and and having seen that, um, and it was a really powerful, interesting moment, and so it's really cool to see a poem sort of try to capture that, um, you know, that feeling and what was going on, the deeper things, because you could sort of watch it and just tell everybody felt um, that something deeper was happening there, which is really interesting. Um, but I wonder if you haven't seen that video, how much different your interpretation of the poem is and, and how much, um, you know. So so a lot of these times, there's a lot of things um, that I will ask. I'll try to find somebody who, um, you know, hasn't heard of the thing or doesn't know more about it to see if they... Um, a lot of times, Alan, um, since he's older, doesn't have a lot of the same cultural references for new things. So I will ask him if it makes sense not knowing it because we want readers to, you know, understand the poem if they haven't seen the video, you know. So there's that that issue going on, too, a lot. Um, uh, but it's really fascinating content here. Um, so the Vagina Goddess is the title. Um, and I think that works as a title. It, it, it um, It's memorable and interesting. Uh, Portland Riots, Saturday night, Sunday morning, July 18, 2020. Um, I, think, I mean, this would just be technically early Sunday morning. I think maybe I just say early Sunday morning. Because we get the time right there. I think that would make it the 19th, too. Um, 1.45 a.m., nightly protests in Portland. So I would like, like here, um, the start of this poem doesn't really... Um, grip in the same way as it could. Like, uh, um, Sheila and a gig walking out in the intersection in the middle of this protest is such a a, a, a big sort of scene. Um, we could build this up a lot before, like set the stage before she enters. And so have, like, describe the, um, instead of just saying that there were nightly protests in Portland, um, describe the actual scene. Like, make it like an ekphrastic kind of, you're explaining what you're looking at at the picture. Like, like make us see the video. Um, if we haven't seen the video. And I think that's what I would do at the start here. And then let Sheila and gig enter. So we get a sense of like this, the, the setup and what's going on. So we can see the visual in our head as we read the poem. So it's sort of a missed opportunity here to fill in that detail. Um, I don't know how many lines that would be worthy of, but maybe, a, but a few or, you know, maybe a, a stanza um, before she walks in. So, um, but then once she does, um, Sheila and gig walks out into the intersection Paces the crosswalk in front of iron police. Officers in riot gear. They stare, eyes fixated on her poise. Headlights glare as she moves, and ballerina poses naked other than face mask and cap. Um, Hecate lies down. Who is Hecate? That's one thing I have to look up to, Hecate. Um, the chief goddess presiding over magic and spells. She witnessed the abduction of Demeter's daughter, Persephone. Okay, that's, yeah. See, it feels like we always talk about the Persephone myth. You'd think I would keep these things straight, but I just can't. Um, but anyway, Hecate um, witnessed the abduction of Demeter's daughter, Persephone, to the underworld, and, and Torch in Hand assisted in her search in the search for her. Thus, pillars called Hecatei stood at crossroads and doorways, perhaps to keep away evil spirits. It's interesting. Um, so calling her... 
I don't know. It feels like we're jumping to a different mythology. Was um, let's see. Oh, I guess I guess um, yeah. Bubba was the same story. Um, but so we're we're comparing the um, um, the vagina goddess. We'll call her. Um, to t- you know, two different people in the same story, Ba and Baobo, as well as Hecate, um, Hecate here, which is a little confusing. That was what I was kind of throwing me off a little bit. So maybe this reference is is too much and just um, throws you off. I don't know. Uh, further than about her body defying their thoughts. Yes, I'm vulnerable. That is my strength. Great line. I love that. I don't know if that's uh, something that... Um, and again, I would use the double quotes. But um, but that's a great line. I'm vulnerable. That is my strength. I mean, that really encapsulates the whole thing. Like the strength to be vulnerable is sort of what was going on there. Um, she opens her legs, a flash to all who dare look. Again, it's probably some punctuation. Vagina goddess of... Eleusinian mysteries. Ba rises from the spiritual place of shame, takes the stone head off patriarchy. I think this is a little melodramatic. I'd rather, um, I'd rather see that and that you know see that done. You take the head off something more visceral than that. It's a little too explainy. Um, come, come, her eyes say to men who believe. You just grab her by the pussy. And again, a little. I think this is a little too. Um, I don't know. I'd love that. I'd like that to be a little more subtle, um, because there's just so much opportunity that when you put it out that clearly, um, it's not taken advantage of. So it's an opportunity to like set up this this stuff a little more than just saying what it is. Um, it's like a show don't tell kind of thing, but a little different version of the show don't tell. Um, come, her body invites. It's dream time again. Divine feminine collective power. She tilts her head to her shoulder. They move away. Grain goddess knows how to relive, relieve tension. Babo knows there's life, even in tragedy. So so this poem, I feel like my general gist of it is it's a, just a fascinating topic and really interesting that you pull in these myths together. Um, the Egyptian vagina goddess and, um, and what it meant in, in the story. Um, I would love all this detail in the poem. I mean, that's just my main takeaway. Like the poem is sort of has so many opportunities to like expand and go deeper into this, you know, more of a storytelling element to what's going on here. Um, so we don't need the explanation at the end. I think the, um, you know, a lot of times we, um, in, in the actual poem, people will will put like an explanation as the last paragraph because they feel like we don't get it and it's not necessary. Here, this explanation, which is not included in the poem, does feel necessary, and I want the whole thing in the poem. Um, you know, I don't want to have to, to read the explanation. I want this to be clear here. And, and that's sort of what we're exploring in this, uh, in the content of the poem. Um, but really cool topic to talk about. I, I love the, uh, I, I love the, um, the explanation of it is really, really fascinating. I wish see what everybody's saying. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth Bouquet says, uh, yeah, well, there's nothing subtle about it. That's true. Um, um, Jenny Middleton says, I know Sheila Nagig is a stone carving of a vagina goddess. Let's see, Sheila Nagig. I thought that was, yeah, that's a good thing to point out. Let me, I thought I knew what that was, but maybe not. Sheila and gigs are figurative carvings of naked women displaying an exaggerated vulva. They are architectural grotesques found throughout most of Europe. Um, um, on cathedrals, castles, and other buildings. The greatest concentrations can be found in Ireland, Great Britain, France, and Spain sometimes. Um, together with male figurines. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. And so I... You know, I was thinking... When the when they got to this, I was thinking of a Sheila and a gig come to life or something. Um, and so I think that that fits with the poem. Is there, does it fit with, um, the, you know, Persephone and Demeter and, and that stuff? I assume that that sort of pulls in, into that, those legends. 
but I'm not, I'm not seeing it here. So maybe not. So maybe we're talking about like two separate myths. Um, at least Wikipedia isn't mentioning Persephone. And... Hmm. Anyway, but yeah, so, so I would just like, like this explanation sort of is the poem. And so I would, so the, Tell tell this through the storytelling of the poem is my is my main takeaway. It's wonderful content. I just love I love that aspect of it. Um, and uh, Peter O'Donohue um, says that's a Trump quote. Yeah, the the grab him by the pussy thing that was from the tape. You know, over you know taped uh, conversation of him uh, before the election. Let's see. Um, Nate Jacob says let the last line simply say oops it's moving too fast where'd it go let the last line say simply there's life even in tragedy a fine assertion from the feminine collective um, where's that they move away green goddess there's life Bobo knows there's life even in tragedy so I, I feel like this poem, um, you know, it's one of the things, it's not, um, you know, going line by line and seeing what's working and what's not isn't really the thing to do with this poem, because it, it sort of feels like the beginning of a poem, uh, you know, the first draft where we realize that we need to tell all this stuff. I, I really think that's the main thing. Um, like, set the scene. I can see how the poem can play itself out really clearly. It's really easy how this, to see how this can go. So set the scene um, where this she and the gig is going to walk out. Um, and, um, you know, paint the stage for us. And then, so we have the armed police, which we get a little bit here, the riot gear and stuff, but, but show the whole scene and then have her walk out. And then through the, through the walking out as the descriptions through that, as you're describing the actual person in, in 2020 walking out, um, explain these, this myths and what's going on in the process of, of just telling this simple story. Um, you know, it, it's a really clear, you know, simple scene to, to, to tell in some ways. But what we want is the extra uh, extra detail in the, the references and, and how it's all playing out, how this ancient myth is sort of coming alive in Portland in 2020. It's, just, it's a really interesting thing. And so so it's really easy to just describe, like straight, like you would say, this is a scene that I'm, t you know, writing in a screenplay or something. I'm just describe it as it happens. And then in the process of describing, explain the myths that are, that are undergirding the whole thing. And, um, and I think that poem would be a really wonderful poem. Um, so it's a really cool, cool subject matter to pull together. And it all makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, so that's what I would do for this one. Um, let's see. Brenda Conley says, Billy explains before he reads if questionable. Who's Billy? Is that Billy Collins you're talking about? I know a lot of people on here uh, watch the Billy Collins uh, broadcast that he does, which I do too. I enjoy those. Headlights can be slang, humorous reference for a woman's nipples. Oh, I didn't even think of that. That's Mary, Mary Ellen Carr. Headlights can be slang, humorous reference for a woman's nipples, and I don't think it should be used even accidentally in this context. That's something I didn't notice, but yeah, maybe. Um, and so that's Billy Collins that Elizabeth was talking about. Um, let's see. Default. So I'm on slow discussion. Okay. You Sorry, uh, the Facebook... Um, Facebook is really frustrating me the last few months. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I'm... Because I'm seeing people reply to comments I'm not seeing. So, um... Someone said, I didn't know about the Portland incident, and Mary Ellen Carr says, me neither. So, yeah, it's a cool video. And I suggest watching it. There's a weird sort of power and, and vibe in the air. Um, let's see. Kim Tedra says, uh, this could be a powerful poem, but I'd connect with it more if there was a stronger narrative element. It jumps from Portland to myth, and I want more Portland woven in, but I like ripping the head off the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. I mean, just just tell this whole story. Um, tell it all in the poem. 
Um, and, and really, it lays itself out so clearly for how you do that. Um, over on YouTube. Um, Kathy says has attracted you such rich imagery. Wow, yeah, I agree. Um, Terry R., um, you go attracta. Uh, Peter Desmond says the female equivalent of the shaman on Capitol Hill. Oh, that's an interesting parallel. I hadn't thought of that, but he was weird. Yeah. Hmm. I'm confused by the assignment of several names to the protagonist, says Tom Barlow. I mentioned that. I, f- I felt the same way. Um, Peter Desmond says they're all goddess names, suggesting interchangeability. Um, Nylena McCurcanis, to me, it's a distraction but what the protests, uh, about what the protests were about. It was, I guess, performance art, but it d- distracts from social context. The poem has no context beyond a version of feminism using Greek mythology. Dick Westheimer says, I love the conceit of using a mythological construct to frame the poem, but there are too many. Who is that for me to keep up or keep me in the flow of the poem? Yeah. Peter Desmond says, T.S. Eliot Wasteland footnotes. Clayton Clark, I also like something about the breath of George Floyd or breath itself included since it wasn't about her. Floyd was the impetus. And, um, and Dick Westar mentioned Sheila Gig is also a great poetry journal and book publisher. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, so I, we've gone on a long time with these, but it's two really interesting, rich, rich poems. And um, I'm way over time. I didn't even, I kind of lost track. <laughs> but anyway, um, let's look at the other poems. And, but thank you for Attractive for sharing those two poems. I really hope that you, um, I hope to see what, you, what comes of, um, especially the second one. I think that's such a, um, I haven't seen anybody write a poem about that. There were some Poets Respond poems, I remember at the time, that were submitted. We didn't publish any, um, but I haven't seen any since. I'm sure they're around. But it's such a cool topic for poems. And the way you bring those the mythology into it um, is really enriches the... Uh, so, so just tell the story and then bring all that stuff into the poem. I think it's going to be great. So I hope, you, uh, I hope you do that. I hope you get to see it. But we got to move on because it's uh, it's been fifty minutes. Uh, June Bin Lee, not quite spring. This is the second poet. We have two poems by June Bin Lee, not quite spring. Snowfalls of dead lilac petals warm my cheeks and freeze my feet, merging with the sky's white blanket. My hair falls to my shoulders now, which get tenser with each condensed exhale, and release with every glance in the mirror where I find spring flowers finally emerging through the cigarette butts and disposable coffee cups, unsure of blooming, but finally afraid to face the cold. It's interesting here. Not quite spring. And this is June Bin Lee. Very different than the other poem. A, a very sim- much simpler and less, um, you know, less like substancey stuff. Snowfalls of dead lilac petals warm my cheeks. And freeze my feet, merging them with the sky's white blanket. So very, very nice description at the beginning. Um, would dead lilac petals, though? I'm just wondering, literally, would dead lilac petals last that longer? I guess it, it's um, not quite spring. It's hard to sort of place where we are, though. So in, in time, because. Um, you know, dead lilac petals. Lilacs, I think, are the first, aren't they like the first flowers to bloom? Um, and so they're like an early spring bloom. And then, um, but then it would be spring because they're blooming. Do you know what I'm saying? So, and they couldn't be on the leaves, they couldn't be on the lilac bushes still from last year. Um, so where are we? Like, what month would this be? I, I think that's a little, little confusing. Uh, my hair falls to my shoulders now, which gets, which get tenser with each condensed exhale and release with every glance at the mirror where I find spring flowers finally emerging through the cigarette butts and disposable coffee cups, unsure of blooming, but finally unafraid to face the cold. Um, So we get this, my hair falls to my shoulders now, which get tenser with each condensed exhale and release with every glance at the mirror there's a really nice rhythm um in cadence of the poem it's a, it's a joy to read it um, actually out loud um again i'm not i'm not exactly sure um so peter desmond says an early frost killed the lilacs but the title is not quite spring i mean the lilacs it's it's 
I mean, technically, the lilacs wouldn't be blooming unless it was... I mean, they're not going to bloom, um, you know, in February or something. Um, and, and this feels like a metaphor. See, the, what, I, what I don't... I'm not following exactly is if this is a metaphor for aging. Is that the kind of, um, you know, seasons of life type um, thing going on here? Um, and a release of every glance. Because we're talking about the mirror... Uh, you know, glancing at the mirror and, and hair falling onto my shoulders now, which is a really important word, that now. Um, so is this sort of an extended metaphor for, um, you know, the, the spring of my life? I don't know, but but life starts with spring. So, so it's a, it feels a little confused to me. Um, but but, but is, it, is it a metaphor for... I don't know, it feels like it's about aging to me. Uh, but the the problem with that is that the youth is, is the spring, like when the flowers come out. And so it would be like the end of spring, not the not quite beginning of it yet. So so for for that way, we're, we're situated. I'm just a little lost in the poem. I wonder if anybody has any uh, suggestions for me that might help out. Yeah, so Nate Jacob... Uh, Peter King Badger O'Donnell, he says, a happy new year, Tim. Yeah. Happy new year to you too. He has to go, but, but yeah, happy new year. Um, Nate Jacob, not quite spring is a late spring snow, right? Emergence from winter delayed by late snow. I guess that would make sense. So, so it's just the title. Um, I mean, it's more like saying not, not spring after all or something. Um, Nate Jacob also says the feeling is confusing to me. Hopeful, hopeless, light, dark. I'm not sure yet. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure just what to place, where to place myself within this poem or, or what to take from it. Hmm. Let's see. So I think this is um, a comment from the author. I didn't send any context, but I am non-binary, and this was written in a significant point of my transition. So that's very interesting. So that sort of adds a whole layer of meaning to this that that um, isn't included. And in, like like so like we were talking about with attractive poems. Like if we get the context, like the context just allows us to go along for the ride. Like if we don't know. Uh, what the contact is, we can't experience it too. And the whole point of poems is to, to sh have that shared experience where we get to step into somebody else's shoes and perspective and mind and heart for a while. And um, if we don't know the situation, um, then then we can't. So so I'm th yeah. So I was completely sort of wrong in imagining what this was about. If this was about um, 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 the significant point of of um, the author's transition. So, um, so, so like, tell us that. So we get to understand what's going on. Um, and then, and then we'll get to go along for the ride too. Um, snowfall of dead lilac petals. Let, let's read it again with that context in mind and see if it makes more sense. Not quite spring. Snowfalls of dead lilac petals warm my cheeks and freeze my feet, merging them with my, the sky's white blanket. My hair falls to my shoulders now, which get tenser with each condensed exhale and release with every glance at the mirror where I find spring flowers finally emerging through the cigarette butts and disposable coffee cups, unsure of blooming, but finally unafraid to face the cold. So that, that context makes it make a whole lot more sense. Um, now, Lena Carcana Car says, I like the idea of blooms emerging from the lost or discarded allusions to non-binary existence could ground the poem. Clayton Clark says, oh, that would be really helpful. Love the sounds and images, but felt lost. Yeah, exactly. So this, so so if, I mean, again, we we do this a lot, but just put that in the title um, so we know what's going on. And then we can, and then we can, you know, feel it with you, which is what we want to do with poems. Um, so, so it makes a whole lot of sense with that context. So that for this one, just add the context. Um. Let me see if there's anything to mention because it's a really wonderful. Um, it, like I said, it, there's a simpleness to it and a, and a sort of simple beauty to the voice. It's really nice. My hair falls to my shoulders now, which get tenser. 
The condensed exhale. This was one. So the now I circles is important. The condensed, I it feel, felt a little off to me every time I read it, which get tenser with each condensed exhale. It's a little too technical um, for the, what's going on with the poem. And a release with every glance in the mirror where I find spring flowers finally emerging through the cigarette butts and disposable coffee cups. And again, I feel like this, um, there's a hole here where we could get a little more description um, of the sort of the landscape we're looking at. It's just an opportunity to say a little bit more. It feels like it, there's a little more that wants to be shown there. Unsure of blooming, but finally unafraid to face the cold. It's really nice. Um, let's see. So D. Coleman says, I was thinking uh, maybe someone coming out of a depression. Um, thanks to JB for the context. Um, Lillian McCarcana says, I like the idea of blooms emerging from the lost or discarded allusions to non-barren existence could ground the poem. We already read that. And um, uh, the author here says, uh, I was wondering how people would have taken this in face value, <laughs> but glad to know. Um, while depression and transition go hand in hand often. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so uh, you know, just this, this poem, we just need the context. I think it'll just come alive more. And then we can get into more... Um, or not, but but there's a lot of stuff here. Actually, there's a lot of um of content that's sort of hidden underneath the surface. Like no pun intended, given the imagery and stuff here. Um, but there are a lot of like seeds under the ground still in this poem, um that are sort of you know could emerge and and but without the context, we don't really know what's going on. So we really can't engage at all with it. Actually, um, okay, let's look at the other poem. The other poem is a tribute to April in Paris. Tribute to April in Paris. I cried tonight, thinking Ursula, thanking Ursula for the flower fields sprouting from my chest, where the dusty ink stains and unheard lectures of slaves and professors danced under Altair to the tune of Latin spells and puppies bark, finally releasing the anxiety of an unwritten book forgotten behind crumbling walls into a cloister of white hibiscus breaking bread and cheese between toasts and blood oaths, cool underneath the ageless shade of that trembling aspen tree, nourished by my rising tide and used tea leaves. So that, and again, the, the style is really nice. I love the voice. There's a way that the, you know, it moves really gracefully through the different lines, the short line breaks. Tribute to April in Paris. Again, we're with April. Um, Ursula, um, is there more than... Let's see. Is there more than Ursula the Goon? Oh, Ursula the Sea Witch, also from Disney's animated feature. And um, is there more to it? Is there a is that myth that we're pulling back again? I, I assume the Little Mermaid comes from a myth. I mean, Triton is um. I don't know. Conception. So I don't know. I, I'm not seeing any references to mythology for Ursula. Maybe it's just a character that Disney actually made themselves instead of just taking. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm thanking Ursula for the flower fields sprouting from my chest. So who is the Ursula? Um, Ursula Le Guin? How do you say that? Ursula Le Guin? 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 It's one of those names that I haven't heard. I've read more than I've heard. Is that who we're talking about? Or, um, hmm. Thinking Ursula for the flower field sprouting from my chest. So, so really wonderful imagery there. I cried tonight thanking Ursula for the flower field sprouting from my chest where the dusty ink, I, I think dusty is one of those words that you just don't want to use. There's certain words that are sort of, um, you know, overused poetic adjectives and things like that. Dusty is one of them. Um, because it symbolizes the time and you know the passage of time and the and all that kind of stuff and decay and so there's dusty things all over the place, ink stains, ink stains too. The whole thing, dusty ink stains, is kind of is kind of just stock imagery that we we we'd want to avoid. I'd say, unheard lectures of slaves and professors danced under Altair to the tune of Latin. What's Altair? See, I'm I'm so um, not well read. Um. 
Altair is a well. This can't be it. It must be. Let's let's disambiguate. <laughs> um, a star in the Aquila constellation. Um, we get characters in video games. So I'm not sure. Um, a football player, a Mexican actress. So I'm not sure what the reference to Altair is actually. Under Altair. Oh, maybe it just maybe it just is the star. Danced under Altair. So they danced under the star in the Aquila constellation? I'm not sure. So that's an int- um, sort of a, a difficult to follow reference. Altair to the tune of Latin spells and a puppy's bark. Finally releasing the anxiety of an unwritten book, forgotten behind crumbling walls into a cloister of white hibiscus, breaking bread and cheese between toast and blood oaths. So we get great... I just love the rhythm and the, the pacing there. Cool underneath the ageless shade of that trembling aspen tree, nourished by my rising tide and used tea leaves. So again, very similar to the last one. I, there's just no context. Um, so it's hard to go along for the ride. It's hard to, to feel what you're feeling. Um, So Kim Tedra says, I'm a little lost in the first stanza, but I love to the tune of Latin spells. Um, Nate Jacob says, I'm thinking flowers blooming are a main metaphor for this poet. There's a softness to these poems in spite of the heaviness of the topics embodied in these those poems. Um, Ursula... Oh, here we go. Jenny Middleton says Ursula is named right from the Great Bear Star. That's why it's Ursula. That makes sense because it's um you know Ursa Major. Um, Kim Tedros says the first two lines of the second stanza could be tightened up. Something like my hair falls under my. Oops, that was the last poem, right? Yeah. Um. Let's see. Ah, so Peter Desmond to the rescue. Lagoon, or Guine, or however you'd say it. So April in Paris is a sto- short story collection originally published in the collection The Twelve, or The Wind's Twelve Quarters. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, now Lima says, I would take out the whole section from the dusty ink to a puppy bark and make a clear reference to your connection to Le Guin. Um Yeah, so, so knowing this would be the title, April in Paris, um, so... So I think maybe um, it's a short story, so you put it in quotes. So maybe just putting in quotes there, and then we know it's something specific. So I was just thinking as I read this that um, I'm in Paris in April, and that's what's going on, you know. So, so, so help us out with that, and then, and then just put like maybe an after Ursula Le Guin there, and then. Um, then we'll know what it's about, and then and then we understand this reference. Let's read it with that context again. Again, um, maybe, maybe this helps. I cried tonight thanking Ursula for the flower field sprouting from my chest. Um, so so is that a line from the book, or, or or an image from the book, or is that um a metaphor for what the book made the uh, the author feel? A field sprouting from my chest, where the dusty ink stains and unheard lectures of slaves and professors danced under Altair to the tune of Latin spells and puppies bark. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel, um, let's see, finally releasing the anxiety of an unwritten book. I, I do. Um, Nilema says, uh, Nilema Kirkanis here says, the anxiety of an unwritten book is a great line. And it is. There's a... Because we we all of a sudden know what you're talking about, you know. There's is there sort of a real tangible thing to understand there, um, and so it's almost it comes to us as like a relief that we oh yeah the anxiety of an unwritten book, um, even though that feels like a sort of a side thing that we just pass over. It's still something that that we know where we are for a second, and that feels good. Forgotten crumbling walls into a cloister of white hibiscus, breaking bread and cheese between toasts and blood oaths. Cool underneath the ageless shade of that trembling aspen tree, nourished by my rising tide and unused, and used tea leaves. So again, so the the context is just even knowing that it's Ursula. Oops, Ursula. My handwriting is terrible, along with many other things that are terrible about me. Um, but um, yeah. So so even knowing that it's Ursula Gwyn and this is a story from her collection, it's still there's not enough context to feel like we're accessing it. 
Um, and so, so, so looking at both these poems t- together, um, there's a really nice voice. There's a nice, um, you know, the, the um, Jun Min Lee, um, clearly someone who reads, reads a lot and has a, a great ear for, for language because the, there's a flow and a rhythm to these. Um, but there's so much withholding that we aren't let into the poem. It's, it's very, they're very personal and private. Um, in a way that, that we can't really access as readers, and that's what's going on here. So the, so adding in the context of this really you know, opens up the poem here, but we don't get the context. And then with the other poem, I still, even reading it a few times, even knowing some of the details that took a while to figure out, I'm still not, um, it, there's still not enough context for me to follow it and feel anything. Um, and I wonder, Ursula Le Guin died recently, right? So maybe if this is a tribute after she died? Because it says, I cried tonight at the beginning. Um, and so this is like a reaction to her death, I'm wondering. Um, uh, but, but it's such a private reaction that we're just not a part of the journey. And, and if you're writing a poem to, to be published and share with people, you want us to be a part of the journey. Like we want to go with you on the journey. And, um, and you're sharing the poem. So, so don't withhold that context. Like let us know what's actually going on, what's actually being felt here. Um, and again, the only thing that feels like we're telling us sort of openly is this one line about the anxiety of an unwritten book, which is something that, um, you know, the speaker's actually feeling. Um, I've for- forgotten behind crumbling walls and the cloister of white hibiscus breaking bread and cheese between toasts and oaths. I just don't know where to put any of this stuff. It, it sounds nice. Toast and oaths to what? Are they references to the book that we, you know, pr- has, most readers probably haven't read? Um, is it, you know, is the puppy's bark something that happens in the book? Um, Dick Westheimer suggests maybe an Ursula Le Guin quote or epigraph would help. And that could too. Um, but just let us in. Let us know what's going on. Um, let's see. Are there any other comments? It's a, it's a late show, but I'm not in any rush today. Marshall Owen says, anxiety of an unwritten book. Could that refer to the writer's transition? That's an interesting thought. I hadn't, um, you know, we usually publish poems, um, <clears throat> just one. And so that actually comes up f- fairly often, um, where there's sort of one poem that's it's more interesting, but you need to know the context of a different poem in the submission that wasn't as strong. And so I'll try to think of, of how we could, um, you know, publish the strong poem while letting you know what the poem next to it in the submission was saying. That, that happens a good amount, which is why I talk about how it's different um, reading, you know, a book where you get the whole context of what the author's writing about. Um, makes it a lot, makes it easier sometimes than just reading individual poems. Um, and so maybe that is something that plays in here too. Um, or maybe not. Like you sort of can't assume, like each poem is its own little world. And unless they're together, even when they're next to each other, you can't really assume that that the speaker's the same speaker. Um, so you got to let us know all that context so we can know how to feel. Um, but yeah. Hmm. So any other? Yeah, Susan Zimmer says, it's very helpful. I see this a lot and do it myself, withholding. Yeah, it was just, we want, we really were drawn, and I've said this before in interviews and things, but um, I really think that honesty and, and intimacy are what we're drawn to. Um, like, I feel like um, like truth, in, in as far as just like the open confession of truth, you know, is what is the main attraction for, for poetry. And I feel like you can hear like the hum of truth in certain poems, whether or not you know the context sometimes, or... Um, no matter what the topic is, um, when someone's speaking authentically, I mean, authentic is another good word too. Um, you can just hear it like a music coming in from a fuzzy radio station, you know? And, um, and so then that's what we want is to, to experience your experience authentically, which is something that's at one level impossible to do, but we can keep trying. And which, what makes it a perpetual, amazing thing is, is all of us trying to, to live in other people's experiences, which is, it's just that's what makes poetry sort of special. And uh, so so don't withhold. Like, let us know the context. Like, let us know the things that you know that apply to the poems. And then we can feel them with you. And that's what we want to do. So uh, 
So don't withhold is just the main takeaway from this. Um, Kimberly McNeil points out this too. I love the anxiety of an unwritten book line. And I wonder if that could just be somehow, I mean, that could be a tiny poem itself too. Um, anyway, I think we are done for today, but thanks everybody. This was June Bin Lee with um, two poems, tribute to April in Paris. And, um, and the other one was not quite spring. And then we had a track to Faye with um, I Didn't Love in the Name of God, um, this poem after Anne Sexton, where, again, for all four of these poems, we, we just want more context, really, because there's good stuff in all of them. Um, and then the other, uh, attractive other poem was, um, Oh, the Vagina Goddess, yeah. This one, I feel like, th- this is on the verge of being a, a poem that's published and, and people really appreciate I think it just needs to, just the story needs to be told. And then the and the note told in the story. But anyway, good stuff here from both poets. Say thanks so much for sharing. It's been a fun, a fun critique. Um, and hope everybody has a happy new year. I'm looking forward to uh, 2022 being the year, which I'm starting to get used to this 2020. It doesn't feel so much like we're living in a sci-fi novel anymore. Um, let's see. So this week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be... Ah, Amanda Newell. Um, and I fixed the typo. It says January now. Um, Amanda, of course, was one of the winners of the Rattle Chapel Prize last year um, for I Will Pass Even to Asheron, uh, the book about uh, one of her students who um, went off to Afghanistan and lost a leg and then comes back. And, and her experience with that is what the book's about. I will pass even to Asheron. And she also has another book forthcoming in 2023. So we'll read some poems about that. I mean, everybody has backlogs. It's kind of a long wait for a lot of writers. So we'll, we'll read some other poems from Amanda, I'm sure. That is Rattlecast number 125. And the, the prompt for this week was... I'm going to have to look it up. The prompt for this week? Oh, I think it was... Yeah, it was something to do with the new year, right? You can tell I haven't written a poem yet. <laughs> Um, Write a poem about a moment of 2021 you'll never forget. So a poem about a moment of 2021 you'll never forget. A good New Year's prompt as we look back on the year that was. And uh, we'll be joining with Amanda Newell, our guest, on Rattlecast number 125, the regular time, Sunday, January 2nd, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend and a happy New Year. Drive safe if you're driving anywhere, of course. And uh, and, uh, have a good one. Take care.